All right, thanks very much. Uh, so my name is David Kaplan. I'm on the security architecture R&D team at AMD. And uh, part of the goal of our team at AMD is to define and architect new security solutions for AMD hardware. And I'm here today to talk about a few of those new features that we've developed uh, around memory encryption, specifically for our x86 chips. So just an overview of what we're going to do this afternoon. I'm going to introduce the features that, on um, the technologies that we've developed, talk a little bit about the, the motivation and the details of how the hardware behaves. And I'll also talk a little bit about uh, how Linux can enable these features. Uh, some of my colleagues have recently, uh, actually Monday this week, submitted some ROC patch series uh, regarding these two features. And I'll talk a little bit about what those, uh, those patches do. So as far as motivation for this goes, uh, certainly we think that memory encryption is an interesting technology and can be used in a variety of cases, but we chose to focus primarily on cloud cases, especially around uh, public IaaS clouds. Uh, certainly security is a top concern in that environment, and one of the top threats that is sometimes seen in uh, CSA assessments and the like is around the hypervisor. Uh, in clouds today, the hypervisor is, of course, responsible for enforcing separation between the guests, and it does this typically using what we call logical isolation features, hardware virtualization, page tables, VM intercepts, et cetera. And, of course, this can potentially break down. There's been a few high-profile uh, bugs related to this, and these bugs can be particularly scary since it can allow one VM to potentially compromise another VM, uh, oftentimes without the target even knowing that it's being compromised. And so we wanted to see if that's, that's something that we can help address. The second thing that we found from talking to uh, some of our partners and customers is that the traditional trust model of computing, if you will, this idea of a hierarchical trust model, doesn't really work very well for scenarios like public cloud. Uh, that is, when you talk to customers of the cloud, they want a sandbox to run their workload. They don't want anyone else to be looking at their data. You talk to the companies running the cloud, and oftentimes uh, they will echo a similar sentiment. That is, they want to provide the resources, but they don't want to be able to see their customers' data. They don't like the, the legal implications of that access, and it would be better if, if they didn't have that visibility. So what we're uh, specifically trying to protect against with the features I'm going to go through today are two different classes of attacks. The first, I'm calling these user access attacks. These are kind of rogue administrator type attacks, things like scraping the memory of a guest VM. Uh, so like someone who has hypervisor privileges scraping the memory of the guest, injecting unauthorized code into a guest VM. and uh, potentially exploiting some sort of hypervisor bug to allow cross-VM attacks. Uh, certainly, hypervisors, if they're written perfectly, this would not be allowed, but uh, we want to see if there's some uh, extra layer that we can add on to here to make it more difficult to conduct such an attack. We're also looking at physical access attacks. Now, how important this is varies depending on who you talk to, uh, but we are also looking at certain things such as uh, physical probing of the DRAM bus on the, the motherboard, cold boot attacks, uh, and, and some variations thereof. Uh, with more people considering non-volatile memory technology like NVDIMMs, we think that this can potentially become more important since cold boot attacks can be a lot simpler if you don't even you know, need liquid nitrogen. So what we've done in this technology is the first thing is we've integrated a hardware AES-128 engine into our memory path. So it's, it's in the memory controller, and it is able to transparently encrypt and decrypt traffic as it leaves the SOC. We then went and defined two new features, what we call secure memory encryption and secure encrypted virtualization, that both utilize this engine to provide different security benefits. Uh, 
The SME feature is primarily designed around the physical attack piece, and it uses a single key. The SEV uh, feature is designed for those uh, VM isolation uh, scenarios and allows for uh, different keys for different virtual machines on the system. And I'll go through the details of, of how that works. Some highlights about both of these features. So the first is that you know, we, we have this hardware engine. It's capable of this inline encryption, decryption. Because of that, uh, we expect this to have a relatively minimal performance impact in typical workloads. Uh, the data inside of the SOCs is not encrypted, and so there's no, uh, there's no impact there. This essentially amounts to a little bit of extra latency as we go out to DRAM. Another key, uh, key feature is that we've defined both of these to be enabled and implemented at the operating system and the hypervisor level. So we're not looking to require application changes with any of these. One, one question. So is, yeah. this, is this like a separate chip on the motherboard, or is, it, is this content in the, in the same CPU package? This is all integrated into the same yeah, SOC package. That's okay. right. And then uh, the final thing I want to mention on this is that the encryption keys themselves are stored in the hardware, and they're not visible to any of the software running on the x86 cores. We instead use this entity uh, called the AMD Secure Processor, which is a physically isolated security subsystem uh, to manage these keys, load them in. We never then send the keys in the clear outside of the SOC. So for anyone who's not familiar, the AMD Secure Processor is a technology that we introduced, I think, about three years ago. Uh, it's present on some of our recent SOCs. It includes this security subsystem, which is centered around a 32-bit ARM Cortex-A5. Uh, it has its own ROM, RAM, uh, some dedicated crypto hardware, keys, the like. We use this to implement a number of security-related tasks in our SOCs. Um, for instance, something that we call Harbor Validated Boot, which uh, if you guys are, I'm sure, were at the talk this morning where, where Matt talked about TPM and static root of trust. Uh, we use this kind of similar to uh, the Intel Boot Guard feature to help validate the first BIOS code that executes on a platform. We also uh, utilize this in some of our uh, current client parts, like notebook parts, to implement what's called a firmware TPM, so it can emulate a, uh, a real TPM without needing to put one on the motherboard. We use this technology with these memory encryption features simply because it is isolated. It runs only AMD-signed code in it, and it has this dedicated hardware that's not accessible from the outside. So the first feature that we have is secure memory encryption. This is a relatively simple feature. As I mentioned, there's one key involved. That key is generated randomly using a hardware random number generator that we have in the security processor. That key is loaded in the memory controllers, and it can be used by the operating system simply by setting a new bit in the x86 page table. So we have a new bit uh, that we call the encrypted bit. And if that gets set, excuse me, then the uh, accesses to that page will go through the AES engine as they go in and out of the SSC. So because of this, this feature is really designed just for a physical attack protection. Uh, and we do support uh, devices accessing this encrypted memory as well uh, through DMA, so there's no, um, not much special work that's needed there. So what, 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 what if the bit is turned off? If, if we already have like encrypted page and the bit is turned off, what happens to the page? So the, uh, you would read the ciphertext of that page. Uh, if, if you have a page that's marked encrypted and you've written some data out to it, that data is sitting in the DRAM chips, it's encrypted. If you then clear the bit in your page tables and read it back, you'll see the, the ciphertext. Okay. Yeah. And the encryption key, we can repeat that, right? The encryption key for, for that feature is generated at boot time. So it, it's different every boot. Uh, 
um, but it stays throughout the lifetime of the, while the chip is on. So this is a, a summary of how this feature works. So there's, like with most x86 features, there's a new CPU ID. Uh, that we actually have a set of functions that provide information about the capabilities. And there's a new uh, bit that we call memory encryption mode enable, which uh, is set at boot time in the sysconfig, which is a model-specific register. And once that is set, then the operating system is free to go and set uh, what we call a C-bit for encrypted on these pages. Uh, where this bit lives is dynamic, and this is partly because there's really no free bits left in the x86 page table. Uh, in the example here that's shown, the C bit is bit 47 of the physical address. And this is convenient for implementation purposes as it allows uh, anyone, including devices, to be able to address encrypted memory simply by setting uh, that upper address bit. Sorry to interrupt you again, but it's all right. is, there, is, there, is there any kind of rollback protection here? So how, 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 how do you know, replay attacks are handled? Right. Uh, we do not have support for integrity protection on the memory, so there's no replay protection in this architecture right now. What about devices you don't want to be able to access the encrypted memory, like USB, like DMA, straight from Right, so keep in mind that this feature, the SME feature, is only designed to protect against uh, physical attacks on the DRAM. So for uh, device-based attacks, we're relying on the operating system to use an IMMU, for instance, to restrict what memory a device can DMA to. Uh, but the fe this feature by itself is not designed to protect against that, that type of attack. Yeah, one more question. It supports multi socket since the, the system address space is consistent. Um, yeah, so, so, so let me explain that a bit more. So, um, in, in a multi socket design, we have uh, a number of different memory controllers in there, and we also have a number of different uh, security engines at that AMD Secure Processor, and they will all communicate. So there is basically a master one, which is kind of like your bootstrap processor, that will generate the key, and then it will send that out to all of the other uh, memory controllers in the design, so they're all consistent. I assume it's encrypted? Yes, yeah, we have a protocol for that. Yes? So we're using a, uh, an address tweak based mode. It's, it's kind of like XEX, uh, where we take the physical address and we, we run it through a, a hashing function and we do an XOR encrypt XOR to basically just to, you know, so different blocks of data that have the same plain text don't look the same in the cipher text. So what kind of block size? It, it's 16 bytes. Because it's, it's AES, right, and we allow arbitrary access to any region of memory. That's correct. If you copy the ciphertext. Yeah. So the, the second feature that I want to talk about, which is uh, a little bit more complicated, uh, is what we call secure encrypted virtualization. And this is a feature where we have multiple encryption keys in the design, and we can associate one key with a hardware virtual machine on the system. And so this is what's getting to this idea of changing the trust model of computing. Uh, our long-term goal would be to have a model where the hypervisor schedules guests and runs them side by side, but uh, is not able to, but doesn't have this, this full visibility. Um, you know, we're not getting all the way there with our first generation, like many things we have to work incrementally, but we're taking, uh, we're taking a big step with this SEV feature, and I'll talk a little bit more about the threat model and how that works in a couple slides. But the basic idea is that we can associate this uh, encryption key with the guess. We also tag all of the code and data associated with that guest throughout the cache hierarchy. So for every line, we know who it belongs to, and we can restrict access to only that particular guest. 
that information is then used when the data leaves the SOC to go and encrypt it with the guest specific key. And we call this a form of cryptographic isolation. And so this is intended to be an extra layer on top of the existing logical isolation features like the page tables. And importantly, it prevents the hypervisor from being able to directly read and write into guest memory spaces, which is a big difference from how the trust model works today. We've integrated this with what we call the AMD V technology. That's our hardware virtualization support that's already supported in all the major hypervisors. Uh, and this is an optional feature in there. And so we can run a mix of encrypted and non-encrypted virtual machines, and, and that all works fine. The very simplified high-level architecture of this looks something like this. Uh, you can see in the red, there's the keys that are present in the memory controller, just shown one here for simplicity. And the AMD secure processor that uh, is the one who actually has access to those keys and also has access to some non-volatile storage as well. The secure processor exposes an API. Uh, and this is an API that is public. We have a spec on our website for it and includes a number of functions related to um, provisioning excuse me, provisioning the platform, launching guests, doing migration, the like. And uh, these APIs are then exposed through the component we call the SEV driver, which is a kind of standard x86 driver that allows the hypervisor to call these API functions to manage the guests without having direct access to the keys or the secrets within the guest. The owner of the guest that's shown on the left here is a key player in this architecture as well. Since the owner of the guest is responsible for managing the guest secrets, managing policy, uh, policy contains information about uh, what is allowed as far as moving data, migration, um, debug, things like that. And the guest owner will actually set up a secure communication channel using a Diffie-Hellman protocol to the AMD secure processor on the SSC, and it's, they're able to authenticate the secure processor, and then they can use that secure channel to pass information that's related to setting up the VM and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the guest OS kernel within the VM is ultimately responsible for protecting its own memory, and I'll talk a little bit about how it's able to do that as well. Now, to walk through one example of how this architecture works, and there, we have a number of flows like this, but, and this is just one case, but this is around what we call launching a guest. And so launching is taking a guest that, of course, is initially unencrypted and turning it into an encrypted guest in a secure way. And so the, uh, the way this flow starts is it will start with a uh, BIOS and potentially OS image that is, is unencrypted that will be loaded into memory that's presumably not really secret, uh, and that any secret information would reside on a, a virtual encrypted hard disk. Then we set up this secure communication channel. We do the Diffie-Hellman exchange, and the hypervisor passes the data back and forth between the guest owner, which may be the user of the cloud, for instance, and the secure processor on the node. And uh, there is, in addition to Diffie-Hellman, there are some certificates that are exchanged here in order to prevent man-in-the-middle type attacks, allow the owner to authenticate not only that this is a real AMD processor, but that it in fact belongs to the cloud that it's expecting it to. The next step is that the hypervisor will ask the secure processor to encrypt the image. And so at this point, the secure processor will generate a new random key, and it will encrypt the image in DRAM of that initial BIOS and OS setup code. And as it's doing that encryption, it will do a measurement of that that will be used in a little bit to uh, send back to the guest owner. The hypervisor will then uh, set up the guest we call the VMCB, the virtual machine control block, with a key selector. So we support a certain number of keys, and the hypervisor manages these, and it puts the appropriate uh, key number into the guest VMCB. And it sends what I call this launch receipt back to the user. And so the launch receipt is that measurement of the memory, as well as some additional platform authentication information. And this allows the guest owner to determine if there 
initial memory image is correct. And if it is, then they can choose to release, say, the disk decryption key to that guest using whatever protocol they're, they're typically using. And uh, at this point, the virtual machine is running. It's encrypted. Any new data it creates will be out of encrypted memory. And it can use its virtual encrypted hard disk like normal. Question? When you say guest owner, is that it's supposed to be off host rather than on host entity? Yeah. Uh, you know, in this example, I think the expectation might be that it could be a service that's hosted at, say, your company's site that's managing guests out in the cloud, uh, just for example. So getting into some more of the details of the hardware architecture. So I mentioned about the, the A set a second ago. Uh, that determines which key number is used, because we can have multiple ones. And that is actually the tag that we then keep inside the cache hierarchy in the SSC. And that ensures that uh, two different guests will never be able to grab each other's data out of the caches, even though the data in the caches is itself unencrypted. The next thing is that we have this mechanism to determine if a page is what we call private or shared. And this is done using that same page table bit that I mentioned with the SME feature, the C bit. And in the AMD virtualization architecture, we have two levels of page tables. We have what we call the guest page tables that are, of course, managed by the guest, and the nested page tables managed by the hypervisor. The guest page tables are used to control if this page is considered private or shared. A private page is encrypted with the guest-specific key, while a shared page is accessible to the hypervisor. We have a few hardware rules about how this works. So the first thing is that any code that's executed is always considered private, no matter what the page table might happen to say, uh, simply because we don't want someone to be able to put data in there and get the guest to execute it without knowing the encryption key. Similarly, the guest page tables themselves are always forced to be encrypted so that their address space cannot be easily manipulated. For data pages, basically everything else, we then use this page table bit. And the, uh, there are some restrictions we have. So for instance, DMA has to occur to shared pages. We don't allow any devices in the system to have access to the guest encrypted memory. And obviously, the hypervisor similarly does not have access to the guest encrypted memory. So any memory that's going to be used for either real or fake device communication is marked shared by the guest. And it's understood by the guest that that data can be looked at and should be properly encrypted or whatever it needs to do. One question that you know, we sometimes get, get asked is say, OK, well, the hypervisor is the guy who supplies this key index into the VMCB. So why couldn't he just lie and put a different key index into there? And there's nothing in the hardware that restricts the hypervisor from doing so. However, we believe that that would be a difficult thing to exploit, simply because of the rules that are outlined here. That is, if you have one VM that you're trying to attack, you don't know his key, you may have another VM that you can control. But if you try to run that VM with the first one's key, the hardware is going to go and it's going to try to walk this guest page tables using the wrong key, which is probably not going to be very successful. Even if it can somehow, it's then going to try to decrypt his instruction stream using the wrong key, which again is probably not going to be very successful. So we see that as being a, a burden towards uh, trying to attack another VM on the system if you don't know the key. So just a quick note on the interaction between these two features. Uh, as we talked about with SME, there is a single option for encrypted or not encrypted. With the SEV feature, it's uh, a little bit more complicated because we do have the two sets of page tables involved. And so we combine both of their C bits as shown in the table here. Basically, the idea is that a guest virtual machine gets first dibs on whether it, its data is considered private or not. If the guest marks his data as shared by setting the CBIT to zero, then we will consult the next level page tables and decide if the memory should be really unencrypted or if it can be encrypted with the hypervisor key. So we can have a system where basically all of the memory is encrypted 
It's just some with a guest key and some with a hypervisor key. And so this is just a quick example of how this address translation works. Uh, in this case, we're going to start with a guest virtual address. We'll translate that through the guest page tables and end up with a guest physical address. And in this example, we're assuming that the C bit is the upper address bit, bit 47, which is set here, indicating that this would be a private page of memory. The hardware will then remember that C bit, but take it off and take a host virtual address without that bit and translate that through the nested page tables in order to get a host physical address. And then at the end, it will put the C bit back on when it creates a system physical address. And this will ensure that this uh, access goes out to the memory as a private guest access. So to compare these two features, uh, there are clearly a number of differences. The first thing is you know, on the threat model. The, the SME feature, as we talked about, is designed really just to protect against physical attacks. The SEV feature, as it's defined here so far, uh, we like to talk about it as protecting against a benign but vulnerable hypervisor. So not a fully malicious hypervisor at this point. We love to get to that, but we're not, we understand we're not there yet. Uh, but we see benign but vulnerable meaning well-intentioned, but there may be bugs. Um, you know, just like with a number of the security features that were discussed at uh, this morning's talk, uh, we want to, to raise the bar. We want to block certain classes of attacks. And uh, I believe that that's what we're doing with this, this SCV feature. And going forward, we expect to be uh, reducing the attack surface even more. We think that right now the attack surface is being reduced substantially. We'd like to get it even smaller. There are some other differences between these two features as shown here. The way the DMA works is a little bit different. Uh, kind of the default behavior is a little bit different. With the SME feature, things are unencrypted by default, and then the operating system has to explicitly mark them encrypted. With the SEV feature, we'll we'll actually keep everything encrypted until we get basically into 64-bit mode or 32-bit PAE, at which point we'll then give control to the page tables to decide what's encrypted or not. And then, of course, there is the, the interaction with the security processor. Uh, the SCV feature uses uh, the API set that I mentioned earlier. So to talk just a little bit about uh, what we've been doing as far as Linux enablement. So there's a number of software components to this feature, and if some of them uh, AMD is developing and we expect to ship, and then there's some that uh, we're working with the open source community on. The first thing is that the secure processor firmware, as I mentioned, it's, it's signed by AMD, uh, and it just exposes a set of maybe a dozen or so API calls, and the spec for all those API calls is on our website. We're also uh, working on the, the Linux driver that will basically marshal the data back and forth to the secure processor. The secure processor is basically just a PCI device with an MMIO interface, so nothing too crazy. Uh, and we'll use this to call functions. We're also working on the kernel support. Uh, so there, say there are two patch RFC series that were uh, sent on Monday to, to the uh, mailing list one related to the SME feature and, and one related to SEV. And we're also working on the uh, open source hypervisors to add support into there as the hypervisors need to use these new API calls in order to start up the VMs, migrate them, and so on. So just an overview of what the Linux support that we have added intends to do. For the SME feature, the first thing is that it needs to set up the feature and get the kernel encrypted. And so we have code during the early boot phase to get in the 64-bit mode and then actually encrypt the kernel in place. And so we're able to do that by creating uh, new page table entries that have the CBIT set. We can copy the kernel basically on top of itself and encrypt that image. And from that point on, we set the CBIT on all entries. So the patches that, that we've developed 
basically try to keep everything encrypted as much as possible. Uh, certainly, there may be scenarios where, for performance reasons or something, you don't want everything encrypted, but the, the set that uh, we've sent up is focused more on protecting against the, the snooping cold boot type attacks. Uh, there is an interface in there for requesting unencrypted pages for special purposes. There's a few exceptions that are listed there as to some of the places that the current code needs to use unencrypted pages, uh, including for just kind of bootstrapping the, the other uh, APs, as well as uh, some structures that BIOS creates back when the system was still running unencrypted and that the kernel needs to access. Now, the SEV patch set builds on top of the SME one. The SME patch set, of course, is intended for when the kernel is running natively on bare metal. The SEV patch set is intended for when the kernel is virtualized, when it's inside a guest. And in some ways, the SEV boot is actually a bit simpler. Uh, because, as we saw in that launch flow earlier, the entire BIOS initial OS image gets encrypted before execution actually starts, there's no need to encrypt the kernel in place anymore. And so it actually starts executing encrypted code and uh, just gets the page table set up and again sets the CBIT on most of the pages. The main exception being the DMA pages. And so the way that this is implemented in the current patch set is that we make use of the software IOTLB uh, in order to bounce buffer the DMA. So we allocate a couple megs of uh, memory space there as shared pages, and then DMA uh, gets copied through that in order to be shared with the outside world. Similarly, uh, existing para-virtualization features use a shared page since they need to communicate with the outside. And so in this initial patch set, this setup is relatively static. There's not a lot of dynamic changing of pages from encrypted to unencrypted status. A couple other changes that are uh, included in here. So as I mentioned, there's the driver that marshals the data back and forth between the uh, hypervisor and the security processor. Uh, I believe that's included in the patches that were sent up earlier this week. There's also a whole set of hypervisor modifications. And uh, I know the, the KVM side of this was included this week. Uh, there's also, of course, a QMU side we're working on. There are four main areas that we are modifying in, in the hypervisor. Uh, the first thing is this concept of provisioning. So that's around establishing trust in the platform and the ownership of that so you can know that you're not being man in the middle. We have this launch process that I kind of walk through about transitioning from unencrypted to an encrypted state along with the measurement. We also have something that we call uh, the send receive functionalities. Uh, the idea behind this is that uh, two secure processors on two different nodes can set up a secure communication channel, authenticate each other, and this can be used to migrate a guest VM within a cloud. And this involves basically one no taking the image in DRAM, re-encrypting it with a transport key, sending it over the network, and then the other one uh, decrypting it, creating a new key for it, putting it into memory. And this same uh, protocol can be used for things like snapshotting um, and, and also presents some interesting uh, use cases related to starting up basically encrypted VM images uh, that you can create an encrypted image, say, on your local machine, move that into, say, a cloud environment, and then run it from there. So you, you said when you migrate, you encrypt on your transport key, mm -hmm. and then unencrypt it the other end. Is, mm -hmm. it in, is it in plain at any point, or is it always in cipher? It, it, it's always in cipher. Uh, the secure processor has its own local SRAM. And so what it will do is it will, when it gets the the transported data, it will decrypt that into its local SRAM temporarily and then re-encrypt from there into DRAM with whatever new session key it establishes. So it's never visible to the x86 processors in the clear, and the SRAM is, is on die, so it's not easily probable. One other point I want to mention on this is this idea of key slot management. Uh, we 
you know, because the memory keys, the memory encryption keys are in the hardware, there is a fixed number of them, and so we have support for basically doing over committing of this and uh, being able to swap keys in and out depending on when you're done running particular guests and the like. I can't say we thought of that. It, it's, it would just be useful from a kind of program point of view to have to write one piece of code on this whole thing. So it's not Yeah, I, I'll look at that. In the, in the API, we have a, a few functions. Um, we call activate, deactivate, and then we have a flush command because the. That's the like TPM. Okay. <laughs> Sounds well engineered then. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that. That's a good, good feedback. So as long as we're on that topic then. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, I, I think that we, we tried to come up with a, a simpler API set that was more focused around the VM lifecycle uh, and these things like migration and launch. Um, you know, the, they say the, the number of APIs we're talking about here are very small, uh, and we're not really like sealing keys or anything like that, right? We're the, the secure processor is just creating them. Yeah, no, I understand that. I, I think that's something that we, that we could look at more. Um, and you know, I, I would certainly say that, you know, to please take a look at the API set we do have on the website and send us feedback. Uh, it's still, I would say, kind of in beta right now. So that would be useful feedback for us. Um, you know, w one thing that we would need to think about with the TPM is, you know, how that would affect kind of the physical attack uh, threat models to if, if there's anything, because it's an external party, that we, we can't communicate securely between the secure processor, which ultimately needs to write into the memory controller, right, and an external uh, TPM. But we, we can have a further discussion about that. Okay, I believe you. So, this is basically the information I have for today. I did want to give some pointers to uh, where we have more public documentation. We, we have a white paper. We have uh, one thing we call the AMD64 Architecture Programmer's Manual. That's the basically the x86 side of the spec. Uh, and so that talks about the CPU ID functions, the MSRs, et cetera. Uh, we also have the Secure Encrypted Virtualization Key Management document, which is what I was just referring to with the API spec. And we invite uh, comments on that, as well as to the RFC patches that that went to the mailing list this week. Uh, I do have two other colleagues that are here uh, with me. There's uh, Tom Lindaki and Brajesh Singh. Uh, they're giving talks at KVM Forum and Zen Summit, respectively, uh, regarding this feature and the hypervisor support that they've been working on for that. So I'd certainly encourage you to seek them out uh, if you have detailed questions around that. Um, and yeah, was there one other question? Yeah, sure. I'd just like to delve into uh, the distinction you made between uh, non-malicious, mm -hmm. but not fully malicious, but vulnerable and, and vulnerable hypervisors. Because going with the use case that you present at the beginning, which I absolutely agree with, what we were talking about is basically um, the hypervisor being in a different trust domain to the guest. In yeah. which case, it doesn't matter whether it's malicious or vulnerable, it's not trusted. And therefore, you have to treat it the same way. So I'm not quite sure what distinction you're making there. Well, so the distinction that we're we're making is that there's um, certain so there's certain threats that we there, there's certain types of attacks that we can block with the current architecture. Um, you know, for instance, if there's a hypervisor bug that allows an arbitrary read primitive to to a guest, 
we think that this technology is a pretty good mitigation for that since it could just read ciphertext from other guests. However, a malicious hypervisor that is manipulating, um, let's say, register state for, for the guests or um, you know, doing uh, things to the, the page tables in ways to try to uh, extract information from an encrypted guest, we don't have protections for all of those scenarios right now. Uh, we certainly are, are working on addressing that. But so, you know, we, we don't want to talk about a fully malicious hypervisor that has basically arbitrary code execution and can do whatever it wants to a guest. We're instead looking at uh, things that say, well, it's pretty good, but it may have these kind of bugs that allow some access, but maybe not a complete arbitrary execution of code within the hypervisor. So you're, you're looking for normal hypervisor um, operation? Yes. Okay. Even, even under a malicious um, actor? Right. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, we would really like to get to the point where we can claim that there's nothing that the hypervisor can do other than denial of service. But, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I guess since I'm almost out of time, any other questions? Yes. Right, so I mean, we, we would consider that right now under kind of the more going down a malicious hypervisor route in terms of setting extra intercepts in order to try to extract information from the registers. I would say that that is the, our, our primary, the, the primary thing that we would like to address in the you know, hopefully very near future uh, because of, of those kind of scenarios. And certainly there can be very important information in the, the register state uh, of the guest at, at certain times. Uh, you know, we see this right now as saying that we're reducing the attack surface because we're taking the entire memory of the guest and we're saying, well, most of that is, becomes a lot less interesting except for the register state, which is somewhat volatile. But, um, you know, that, that is our, the, the area that we're focusing on the most right now. Right, so we, we don't have any side channel protection in this architecture. Um, I mean, even with caches, you can, even with the tagging that we have in the caches, there are still potentials for timing-based cache attacks. Uh, that hasn't been something that we've, we've treated as in scope for this feature. We do have tagging in TLBs already, in fact, to make sure that VMs can't use other VMs' translations and things. But as far as um, the side channel piece, we don't do anything with that. Yeah. What general time frame is something coming out with this? Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to say right now. Sorry. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks very much.